Hello, I'm Matt Kelly. And I'm Matt Dancona. And this is The Two Mats for the week ending Friday the 18th of August, a podcast that is definitely all-inclusive. It is all-inclusive. And the reason I'm saying (laughs) all-inclusive is that that's exactly where I am right now. I'm on an all-inclusive holiday in Corfu. So very nice it is, I have to say. 36 degrees out there. A bit bloody hot, to be fair. Anyway, what did we talk about in this episode, Matt? Many things. Uh, We talked about Trump and his fourth indictment and the gangster the gangster state of america tory crooks too and how they had their own gangsterism uh we talked about uh the lionesses and um yep. gentle fun was poked at me and my ignorance of football <laughs> rightly so it was it was and we also gave um our little memories of of the great michael parkinson who has passed away sadly um we certainly so, did uh, Rest what, should in we, power. what should we call this episode? Georgia on my mind? Sweet Georgia? Uh, Georgia on my mind. Gangster para- Gangster's Paradise? Gang- gangster's Paradise. Uh, gangsters I like that. That's better. Gangster's Paradise. Let's go Gangster's Paradise. Yeah, that's, that's a winner. And if it doesn't get us in, end up in the libel courts, then we'll be here next week as well. But anyway, here's for this week's discussion. Yeah. This is The Two Mats, Episode 9, Gangster's Paradise. Enjoy. <laughs> Okay, so Matt, what should we talk about this week? Well, funnily enough, I think we have to return to the lawfare of America at the moment and the fourth indictment uh, against President Trump, and it's at state level in Georgia. And um, can we go uh, third, Matt, our producer, and and give us a little bit of taste of the late night press conference that uh, Fannie Willis, the district attorney from Fulton County, in Georgia gave on on the indictment. Specifically, the participants in association took various actions in Georgia and elsewhere to block the counting of the votes of the presidential electors who were certified as the winners of Georgia's 2020 general election. As you examine the indictment, you will see acts that are identified as overt acts, and those that are identified as predicate acts, sometimes called acts of racketeering activity. I mean, it's heavy stuff. It's heavy stuff, isn't it? It really is. And the most important thing uh, in all of that is the fact that she is using, as she said, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act in Georgia, which was passed in 1980 after the original federal uh, legislation a decade before 1970. Now, what is this? This is legislation that was passed um, many decades ago in order to capture the mob, the mafia, because it was incredibly difficult to get um, because of the code of a murder of silence in 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 the gangster underworld. uh, It was very difficult to get people to uh, flip to turn state's witness. And so what Rico legislation did was it it um charged everyone as part of a racketeering conspiracy and the idea was you get everyone in the courtroom and you put them under intense pressure and essentially in terms of mob um cases you you know you hope that uh the bookkeeper or you know the guy who used to run a, a, a small numbers um racket will turn and will flip and that enables you to get more and more people more and more testimony until you get up to the the top dons you know and the underbosses and the 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 big guys now um why does this matter it matters because she's using anti-gangster legislation to prosecute a former president donald trump and his associates and first of all you think this is is this just ingenious and then you read the indictment. It's 98 pages long, but it's actually quite a, a, a swift read. And there's lots of really well annotated um, uh, versions of it out there. The CNN version is very good. The New York Times version is very good. If, if listeners have a chance to, to read it, it's really good. Because it is like reading, um, uh, you know, a Dashiell Hammett 
novel or a Raymond Chandler novel. I mean, these people are gangsters. And some of the names involved are incredible, like Misty Hampton, who was the elections director in Coffee County, Georgia. And um, there was a there's a allegedly crooked pastor called Stephen Lee, who allegedly pressured one of the election workers, uh, Ruby Freeman and her daughter, in order to uh, uh, pursue this election fraud. And and there's a supposedly crooked Atlanta area bondsman called Scott Hall. And and, and it's light reading a, a kind of pulp fiction crime novel. And you keep having to pinch yourself and remember, this is the actions taken by a guy who was still in the White House because this was before Biden's inauguration. It was after the election in November 2020, but before Biden was uh, inaugurated in uh, on January the 20th, 2021. And they are going around and they are harassing, allegedly, uh, people. They are putting in false electors. They are trying to gain access to voting machines. I mean, this is gangsterism. And it's a very it's a chilling document i mean first of all it's absorbing as everything with trump is it's you 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 have to you have to pinch yourself but it is actually quite scary because you think what we're seeing here or what we saw here was the emergence of america of all countries as a kind of gangster state that was what trump uh was trying to do and if he's re-elected that's what he will try and continue to do we have here a former president of the United States who is subject to four criminal indictments and is also the front runner to be the Republican presidential nominee in the elections next year. This is unknown terrain and it's really important not to get desensitized or blasé or say, oh, another week, another indictment, because this is, you know, this is very, very serious and scary stuff. And, and and I think one of the um, sensational aspects of this is that it's not federal, it's state. Absolutely. And he can't get himself off the hook if he's elected. And the idea that, uh, it, you know, it is it is counterintuitive, isn't it, that you would you would assume that the federal charges were the ones that would be potentially the most threatening. But actually, it's the fact that it's a state prosecution means he cannot uh, pardon himself. He uh, is going to be scrutinised. It will be televised. He will be mugshotted. It will be he'll be treated like any other defendant. And um, I, I I found it astonishing that uh, you know you, the reaction. Hillary Clinton, for one, struck me struck the tone uh, where she said. She didn't feel any satisfaction. She felt a great profound sadness that we have a former president who's been indicted for so many charges that went right to the heart of whether or not our democracy would survive. I mean, it, it is, it's hard to imagine a greater statement of peril, isn't it? You know, that actual American democracy was on, on, in jeopardy. But having said that, if you take that step back that you're asking us to, Matt... Uh, it does seem that the system is working, you know, that that yeah. American democracy is surviving and and hopefully, fingers crossed, this will hamper his presidential run. Uh, and even if it doesn't and even if the worst case comes true and he ends up back in the White House with the ability to pardon himself of federal crimes, well, Georgia, the state of Georgia can still bring him down, which is an astonishing situation. It really is. And, and uh, I was grateful to you for, for alerting me to the Hillary quote, because it was it was a very striking uh, statement by her because she was caught off guard. She'd actually gone on MSNBC to talk about a, a, an actually very good essay she'd written for the Atlantic magazine on loneliness and isolation and how those forces are compounding polarization and a sense of disenchantment with politics is really good read but she'd gone on to msnbc to talk about this and in the middle of it they got the news the indictment and so what you got out of her was very much you know her immediate and candid response she hadn't overthought it and it made me think wow if if she'd won in 2016 and then been re-elected in 2020 she'd now be you know, approaching the final year of her second term, 
you know, and it's an, it's a very strange counterfactual to consider. But to your point, Matt, and I think it's the key is, yeah, the good news is the legal system is working because the political system didn't work. You know, the uh, Trump was impeached again, but on a technicality, the impeachment was delayed until after he'd left office. And it was judged that you couldn't impeach an ex-president in the Senate. So that didn't work. And then the Republican Party has gone completely off the reservation and appears determined to uh, nominate Trump at all costs. There are various other candidates in the wings. And in fact, the first uh, candidates debate, uh, Republican candidates debate is uh, next week in Milwaukee, sponsored by Fox. And there's a question mark as to whether Trump will turn up. I doubt he will. But, you know, he is miles ahead. It's very hard to see him losing this nomination. You never know. But uh, every time he's indicted, his figures with, amongst Republicans go up. He gets more donations. So you've got this very dangerous thing where he is he he left office fighting the electoral system. And now he is trying to regain office fighting the legitimacy of the legal system. So that's a massive challenge to the American system. As you say, he can't pardon himself because it's a yeah. uh, state charge. He he will try uh, to get this turned into a federal prosecution, but I think he'll fail because what he was doing in the indictment, the issues being discussed in the in the indictment, are all those of a of a presidential candidate, not a president. He's not doing things um, ex officio as the, you know, the, the president at the tail end of his term. He's he's saying to uh, people, you know, in in and outside of Georgia, you've got to do what I say. And there's the classic, now classic phone call to uh, the Georgia Secretary of State Brad uh, Raffensperger, where Trump says. All I want to do is this. I just want to find 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have. Now, you know, if that isn't an attempt to uh, defraud the election uh, system, I don't know what is. So it's good news that he's he's being held to account. Another thing which is like a, a, a side issue, but I think it's been underreported is a lot of talk about coups and civil wars and all that bubbling away. The American military in all of this has behaved impeccably. Mark Milley, General Mark Milley, who is the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, during this crucial period that the indictment covers, told Trump in no uncertain terms, you know, we are not go, we the military, we the American military are not going to help you hold on to power. And indeed, we will all, you know, he and his fellow chiefs of staff would resign if Trump tried any monkey business. So in thrillers, you know, uh, it's always the military that, that, that lead coups and prompt civil wars and lead to a breakdown of order in America. I, I don't think there's any danger of that. And that's really important. I find it astonishingly chilling that that statement even needs to be made. You know, it's yeah. it, it's frankly scary that... It's in the mindset, it's in the calculus that maybe the military will take. You know, the idea that there could be effectively a military coup in America, I mean, and that they have to say, no, there won't be, we won't, we won't go that far. <laughs> it's, it is, as you say, it's the stuff of, uh, of Pulp Fiction nightmare. It is. Uh, and, and it's worth saying that there are prominent Republicans who are now talking about civil war. Uh, Matt Gates, who's a congressman in Florida, um, only a few days ago was talking openly about civil war. Matt Maddock, who's a congressman, Republican congressman in Michigan, was talking about civil war. A slightly scary statistic. Uh, there have been 233 acts of political violence in the United States since January the 6th, 2021, and 39 people killed. And the great expert on, on all this is a academic called Barbara F. Walter, who who um, who wrote a great book uh, published last year about how how civil wars happen, and her view is that 
America is passing through the stages of what she calls pre-insurgency and incipient conflict and is now on the cusp of open conflict. Now, that's just one academic's view, but it's it's pretty chilling. Um, another Another point I think which we should bear in mind is that if it's televised, the Georgia case, um, that it may well be exactly what Trump wants. You know, uh, you go back to the Watergate hearings, 80 million Americans watched that. You go back to the OJ trial, 150 million Americans watched that. This would, if it was televised, this would be the Trump show. The case, the legal cases would not be a distraction from his campaign. They would be the campaign. This is not a great place for the most powerful nation in the world to be. And we've got a lot more of it to come. We don't know when these trials are going to be held. The Georgia case they want to try in six months. Well, it's in the nature of this uh, prosecution that they want all 19 defendants in the room at the same time. Well, good luck with that. I mean, that is going to take a long time to schedule not to speak of um, the other indictments. So we don't we don't know how much of next year is actually going to be taken up with court time or not. That's very variable. But it's clearly going to dominate um, this campaign, which is Trump constantly saying, you know, the Department of Justice under Biden has been weaponized and politicized. I am a victim. Prosecution is persecution. That's going to be his narrative. OK, so that's that's Trump. So my theory about the bad guys always having better communications uh, advisors and, and making the headlines uh, read read well for them in the media, certainly playing with Trump, less so over here with one story that I think hasn't had it, half of the attention it deserves. But it's the um, terrific investigation by The Guardian's David Conn and Paul Lewis into Michelle Moan, Lady Michelle Moan, and the uh, enormous profits um, she came by uh, circuitously via a uh, huge um, uh, deal for what turned out to be useless uh, protective PPE, um, surgical gowns and gloves during the COVID crisis, uh, money that she ended up uh, using to buy a yacht uh, and a racehorse and a jet. It's an extraordinary story, um, but it's really not getting the airtime I think it deserves. Uh, and, and lots of people asking questions like, why are the Met, the Metropolitan Police, not investigating this? At least, you know, why in the interests of transparency and to give the opportunity to everybody to, to prove either innocence or guilt, why is this what at face value seems an incredible accusation of potential corruption between the government and uh, Tory peer is why is this not being investigated by the authorities? It's amazing. I don't have an answer to that because I agree with you that it's obviously uh, the kind of apparent malfeasance that should be under investigation already. And it does it also plays to this idea of the gangster state in a different way, a very British way, which is that under Boris Johnson and during COVID in particular, you realised that the Conservative Party, which had always been the party of the rule of law, whatever else it had been, it had been the party of the law. And, you know, Margaret Thatcher, for all her flaws, had endlessly reiterated this, you know, the, the many quotations from her saying we're the party of the rule of law or we're nothing and that stopped during the johnson populist era you had ministers saying quite openly you know we're quite happy to break international law you had party gate which wasn't just a scandal it was a scandal that showed the conservative party elite really didn't think that it was subject to the law that the rest of us are. And then finally, and in a way, this is the most serious thing, what you're talking about, Matt, which is during COVID, there was a lot of very, very rapid back of the envelope procurement. And I think we're only scratching the surface of the kickbacks and the corruption that will, or at least should emerge from that process because there was a huge rush to get PPE, to get testing equipment, all the things that we didn't have because we weren't prepared for the pandemic. 
And a lot of people said, hey, I've got a mate or, you know, my company that I'm associated with can do this. And money was flowing out the treasury. And we were all, up, you know, our minds were on other things, not dying, getting vaccinated, looking after our elderly relatives and so on and so on. Meanwhile, you know, we were we were in many respects becoming a kleptocracy. You know, we were becoming a gangster state. And I think that that degeneration on both sides of the Atlantic, these are, you know, the US and the UK, they're two G7 nations. They both have a permanent seat at the UN. They're supposed to be the two lead figures um, in, in the NATO alliance and defenders of and champions of liberal democracy and everything that goes with it. There's, there's a degradation, there's a decay going on there. And it's something that you see happening everywhere. Um, we're not uh, uh, we're not at uh, Putin's Russia now. We're not a mafia state yet. Let's not exaggerate it. But the gap is closing. Well, I think if if this was a Labour government, uh, and I'm not being I'm not being partisan here. I'm, I'm being as objective as I can be. But if this was a Labour government, and it was a Labour peer who had, let, I mean, it's worth restating the the simple facts, which is that. Michelle Moan contacted Michael Gove and said that she could help with, uh, through her team in Hong Kong, she could procure millions and millions, hundreds of millions of pounds worth of protective equipment. Uh, I don't actually blame Michael Gove specifically for this, although I blame him for plenty of things, but I don't blame him specifically for this. I think he probably passed on a communication in good faith. But... If Rishi Sunak is wanting to restore integrity in, in government and faith in politics in this country, this is precisely where he needs to start. He needs to make an example of this case and make a, a huge fuss about exposing, making a transparent investigation. His, his, his usual play act about, oh, well, we can't get involved until process has been played out, you know, and all of this nonsense is not good enough at this point. He needs to get involved. He needs to show that this country does not tolerate profiteering in something, at, you know, at such a sensitive period of our time that people are alleged to have been profiteering is an accusation that cannot be left lying there, dormant, which is exactly how the Daily Mail and the Sun and all the, the other right-wing media are, are, are treating it. They're letting it lie dormant and they're hoping it's going to go away. Fair play to The Guardian for absolutely you know, yeah. going at this 100%. Excellent investigation. Our front page next week will be a picture of Michelle Moan on top of, standing on the deck of the boat that she bought with the profits of this deal. And the headline will say, stop this boat. <laughs> you know, if you want to restore faith in democracy, stop this boat, Rishi Sunak. Because this is where it has to start. You cannot survive as a government with the idea that there are uh, rules for some and, and rules for others and the two are divergent and that if you're on the inside and if you're a mate and if you are useful or seen to be of PR value to the government or you know or if you're just a very clever chancer then you can get away with stuff that the ordinary man or woman on the street could never do. You can't get away with that. So Rishi Sunak needs to uh, absolutely get a grip of this. Otherwise, I do think over, over time, through social media, hopefully through you know, the continued uh, pursuit by The Guardian, by others, including ourselves, this will not go away. That's my fervent hope. And when you said he must get a grip, you and I both know he won't. You know, that, that, that's what his defining characteristic, I think, is that he hasn't got a grip. You know, the promise was he was going to get a grip, as you said, integrity, professionalism and accountability. None of those things have happened. He's been reduced to the squalid distraction politics of small boats week. Um, and, and then this week to a, a slightly... Um, dodgy attempt to move the goalposts on cancer targets you know this is not the behavior of a government that's been in power for 13 years it's the behavior of a pressure group 
these are marks of end of empire you know they 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 they're the, the these are decline and fall characteristics you know we we don't know what the general election will bring but what is certainly the case is that sunak does not have a big bold offer to the public for a fifth term i mean my fear is is that nor does keir starmer frankly yeah. and that he's just uh in in the fo- in the very fortunate position of being in in that uh in the opposition at that death of empire, as you described it. Okay, Matt, well, um, let's come back in a couple of minutes. Thank you for listening so far, listeners. Come back in a couple of minutes, and we're going to talk about... I can't even remember what we're talking about now. Lionesses. Oh, yeah. See you in a minute. So, Matt Dancona, I'm going to defer to your greater knowledge on all things football here. What's, yeah, what's the I'm big the story with, with well, uh, I gather English that football? The, yeah. These... Uh, these plucky uh, <laughs> women footballers uh, have have rather excelled in the World Cup down in Australia, and we're into the final. And uh, this is incredibly exciting. We are. Uh, the first time uh, an England football team has been in a final since 1968. 66. I, I, even I know that. Well, it's, yes, I should qualify that by saying the first time a World Cup final. Because, of World course, Cup, did I say the a World, Lionesses a World Cup were final? Yes. the Euro champions yeah yeah fine and they they won the euros i was at, euros. i was at that game at wembley really uh, <laughs> they did and they were no, I, I, knew, I knew that i knew that <laughs> i have a particular interest in women's football because my daughter is um a footballer for millwall football club under 18s so it's footballer of the year was she not she was, was she... she was player of the season for her age group in the under 16s the year fantastic uh, last season and now she's great it is. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a big. Ju- it's a big jump from under sixteens to under eighteens. Yeah, she's, sure. She's doing well, and she loves the. The nice thing is, she loves. She loves playing, and it's a really nice team um, to play for Millwall. Um, really, sort of progressive, good coaching. Take it very seriously. So, and 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 what better time to be involved in women's football than right now? Because it's absolutely taken off. One of the things that's been extraordinary to watch, and wonderful, has been the way in which. Without much friction or difficulty, the women's game has just become absolutely massive. Uh, you know, there was a time when it was it was treated with derision, but that seems a very very long time ago now, and and a time of you know unenlightened views. And now you know people that my local cinema people went and watched the the semi live, and they're, they're going to go and watch the final on Sunday, and. You know, there's a wonderful sense in which there's the men's team and then there's a the women's team, and you know we we get excited about both of them. W- what I also think about this is well, two two thoughts occur to me, Matt. Tell me whether either are valid. The first is stand by. It's already started uh, for a horrific blizzard of politicians wrapping themselves in the England flag. Um, there's a sort of bogus. Uh, called by the opposition parties for a bank holiday if they win, if the Lionesses win on Sunday. Uh, Rishi Sunak has already tweeted it irritatingly about it. And and there is that kind of very depressing way in which politicians who have no interest in the game at all rush it. I think Keir Starmer does, but Rishi Sunak, I'm sure, doesn't rush in and try and you know make it them, their own. The other thing is, I think there's something very irritating about people like me who get incredibly excited at international tournaments, claim all sorts of levels of knowledge about the intricacies of the international game and go and see Dear England at the National Theatre and swing, sing Sweet Caroline at the end and all the rest of it and then stop after the tournament's over because they know nothing about the club game. And I totally understand, though I have no way of not doing what I'm about to do, um, the, the, the fury of people who really know about football like yourself with dilettante weekend driver football fans like me, you know, who 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 at the Euros and at the World Cup get terribly excited, terribly. That's all they talk about and then just disappear off the pitch. Well, listen, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a pass, a free pass on this, because uh, I think I, it, it's not uh, irritation, I feel, but pity. <laughs> because I think, but if you think about, if you think about the joy that 
following a football club brings you, even if you follow a lousy football club like yeah, Everton, yeah, especially even if you follow a, a a terrible football club like Chelsea or Matt or like Nick Robinson con- constantly tells all his listeners about his his joy of Man United, whether it's mm. relevant to the story he's reporting on or not. But the the fact it's the thing that stays with you, your life more than anything. You know, your parents come and go. Your wife may come and go. Your kids certainly will walk off into the sunset at some point and leave you on your own. But your football club never leaves you. And I can't think of anything else that that stays like that with you as part of a, a community that really also you don't even have to pay anything to join. You know, it's you don't even have to go to a game no. or anything like that, although it's it's much nicer experience if you do. But the I do appreciate and I do feel sorry for people who who haven't been brought up with that that great affiliation to to something that is so meaningful and so unmeaningful at the same time. It's just a wonderful world to be involved in. Pity is the word and uh, uh, it's generous of you not to vilify me, Matt. Um, But I tell you this, I am a disgrace (laughs) in my family, a disgrace because I think I've told you before my my father who was born in malta uh played a couple of seasons for newcastle and he remained passionate about the game until his 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 death um interestingly he 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 um supported liverpool not quite sure why but he did a man of superlative taste a man of superlative taste my both my sons now aged 20 and 22 are man united fans um, the 22-year-old lives in Ooh. Manchester. Oh, sorry, Matt, but you know, I'm just... Hey, don't blame the messenger, right? Um, yeah. And they both go <laughs> to Old Trafford quite a lot, especially the, the older one who, who lives in Manchester. So I've let down the family in this regard. You know, I, I have no excuse. And I think You're it's You're the like, anomaly. I think it's worse than anomaly. I think it is. It's like an impairment. You know, I think I could probably... Get, if I could drive, I could get access to the disabled uh, driver's spot at, at Sainsbury's, right? Because it's just like, a dis- yeah. it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a protected category under the Equality Act 1910. And I can only say to the listeners, to you, sorry. You know, I'd like to say, I'd like to apologise yeah. fully and finally. I, I Apology intend to, accepted. I intend to educate but- myself and <laughs> I'm sorry for any hurt i've caused members members of the footballing community and that's very sweet of you i think to to offer that apology which is which it's is the least i could do required frankly but we can <laughs> both agree um that uh we'll be cheering on the lionesses uh on the weekend but he, listen here's an interesting fact for you because you said and i said also that women's football is you know ex- experiencing this boom but did you know in 1920 so more than 100 years ago there was a, a women's football game at Goodison Park, the home of Everton, uh, which sold out. 50,000 people came to watch. I've got the name of the clubs here. It was Dick Kerr's Ladies versus St. I don't know who Dick Kerr is, but Saint, and versus St. Helen's Ladies. 50,000 people came to watch the game and there were Amazing. thousands locked out. And I, sus- I suspect that they came to witness the spectacle. But nevertheless, it was taken so seriously by the FA that uh, they banned women's football after that. You know, oh, they really? said, this. no, this is wrong. This can't carry on. Uh, yeah, they were really threatened by it. So anyway, we do live in enlightened times. We and do. come on, you lionesses. Let's come see on, you lionesses. Can... Yes, come on, do it for England. Do it, do it for England. Okay, well, Matt, what didn't we have time to talk about this week? Oh, lots. Well, uh, A-level results, um, which neither of us were... Uh, taking a levels this year well at least i wasn't maybe maybe you were um and well, so my, my son was oh, oh and uh, i didn't know that i'd go okay yes. uh, so let me let me tell having bored you about how proud i am of my eldest daughter let me bore you about how proud i am of my eldest son who has i won't he, he asked me not to go into specifics of his results but he did oh. very well in a very oh, well tough year him. and he got a place at uh, he got a place at his university course his first course so absolutely well, thumbs up for, for thumbs Theo, up for, and, and I hope, Theo. and I hope, by the way, um, those kids who didn't get their uh, results and who were disappointed uh, today, today we're recording this on Thursday, so those who didn't get their results, bear in mind that it doesn't matter. 
and you will be fine. I got two U's and an E. So I was that failure at A-levels. And I, I, I'm quite happy with the way things have turned out. I do wonder whether it's harder these days to get into a profession like journalism, for instance, if you haven't got a university uh, degree behind you. And I think that's a great pity. When I was at Archant, which was a local newspaper company that sadly went went bust uh, a couple of years ago, I made it a point to um, have access to cub reporter jobs and cub journalist jobs for people without degrees because it, it's otherwise it's very hard to break in. But yeah. that said, you know, if you got if your results sucked on on Thursday morning, don't worry about it. There's plenty of great stuff you can do without a degree. Believe you me. There, there really is one other thing that I think we sh- we can't let pass because we're middle-aged men who, who who remember him in his absolute pomp is the very sad death of Michael Parkinson. Yeah, I mean favorite memory. Oh, I mean the Ali interviews. I've got his book on uh, interviewing Ali, and it's it's, yeah. it's it's a great read. And and he had that because he was an uh, interviewer for so long. He was able to interview people at different stages of their career. And Muhammad Ali was someone he had a real rapport with and and you know he was a very he was a very specific kind of interviewer and i think he kind of didn't he defined modern interviewing on telly and you know to call him a national treasure doesn't really capture how much he was the guy um died aged 88 you know he had an amazing life i have to say my favorite outstanding memory not my favorite memory but the one that is most outstanding in my head is when he got savaged by rod hull's emu and i just think it was his (laughs) i mean it's if you if people if listeners haven't seen this yeah i mean it's it's a shame to mention it because i don't think parkinson actually handled it very well he got very ratty with rod hull in a in what was a very very predictable uh, line of attack literally but um it made for amazing tv it, it, and it was all the nation was talking about for about a week it, it, was this this glove puppet attacking michael parkinson it, it was in the days when um you know everyone watched the same thing broadly speaking you know and uh, parky's show got huge audiences and also as you, said, you imply if yeah. you have rod hull and emu on your show it's pretty obvious what's going to happen um the other thing that made me laugh about thinking about rod hull and emu yeah. was being old enough to remember when emu wasn't the European single currency, you know? <laughs> if you say emu, I mean, I'm not sure many people know that emu is a single currency anymore, but, you know, there was a period I remember when emu started after Maastricht, people started talking about emu. And every time they did, I just burst out laughing because I thought of that very moment and uh, poor old Parky being savaged by, yeah. by the puppet. It was brilliant, brilliant television. Well, sad news and rest in peace, rest Michael in peace. Parkinson. I hope you're up there in the pearly gates, <laughs> keeping keep keeping away from Rod Hull and Emu. Yes. Anyway, so remember, folks, that the latest edition of the New European is on newsstands now, and it's also available on our website. That's at theneweuropean.co.uk. And listeners to the two mats can get a great deal on a subscription. Just head to the neweuropean.co.uk forward slash two mats. That's the number two. M A T T S. There's a link in the show notes if you need that. Uh, and I will personally give every single new subscriber a fabulous £25 bollocks to Brexit passport cover, which is sported by all the best people at all the best border queues throughout Europe. So that's, that's yours for free when you sign up to the fastest growing media title in Europe which we are, which is amazing, thank you thank you also to producer Matt Hill at Rethink Audio the third Matt, thanks Matt, and until next week it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from him goodbye, goodbye